Senator Bernardi. And the radical green movement. I am not a climate change sceptic. Historical, <laughs> historical evidence suggests that climate of our planet has continually evolved and it always will. Thus, I am 100 per cent sure that our climate is changing. Of course, that begs the question, what is driving it? The government will have you believe that climate change has been driven by carbon dioxide, or more specifically that man-made CO2, which comprises less than 1 per cent of atmospheric carbon mass, is the culprit. And despite the plethora of evidence to the contrary, those committed to the anthropogenic climate change industry have too much of themselves invested in this new religion to admit they actually might have it wrong. And when I say there is a plethora of evidence refuting their claims, I mean, I mean there really is a tonne of the stuff. Firstly, we have the irrational claims made by the high priests of climate change themselves. Alarmist of the year, Tim Flannery. He once stated that the seas were going to rise by 100 metres, not the one metre that Senator Billick just told us. He was wrong. Great video hoaxer, Al Gore. Produced, he won a Nobel Prize for producing a flawed and alarmist mockumentary that contained a litany of errors and that requires a guidance note issued before it is viewed by British children. For over two decades, the shrill cry of the alarmists has declared we only have five years to prevent a climate catastrophe. I could go on and on and on. The list of extremist mumbo jumbo uttered by those who profit from fear, either financially or electorally, and one could call them the prophets of doom, gets louder and louder. And as well, they must raise their voice, not because any of their predictions have been realised, but simply because they haven't. When confronted with the very inconvenient facts that they have been demonstrably wrong again and again and again, they simply raise the decibel of their cry and the level of their hyperbole attached to their claims. But tonight I shall leave the rebuttal of their hysteria there. Suffice to say, there are many, many examples of attempts to scare the public by the prophets of doom. And yet, despite these very loose advocates, I do have an open mind on the bills before the Senate today. By an open mind, I mean I am genuinely undecided. I am unsure if this bill and the associated bills is singularly the worst piece of legislation ever dealt with in this chamber, or is simply the dumbest one. Either way, it is a bill built on flawed science, fuelled by unsustainable hysteria and lacking in any demonstrable benefit to our great nation. After all, ask yourselves, isn't this the primary requirement of any government to act in Australia's best interest? Isn't that why governments are elected? to defend the country and its citizens by looking after their interests. I certainly hope most senators in this place agree with that comment. But alas, the supporters of this bill seem unconcerned with the interests of our nation. If they were committed to acting in Australia's best interest, they wouldn't be endorsing a new tax that will impact on every man, woman and child in this country without any meaningful benefit. They wouldn't be advocating a scheme that will cost tens of thousands of jobs without any meaningful benefit. They wouldn't be championing a plan to export domestic industry, domestic jobs and domestic profits to foreign lands without any meaningful benefit. And how can I state so equivocally there will be no meaningful benefit? Well, the stated aim of this bill is to address dangerous climate change. It fails to do that on several levels, and I'd like to touch on just a couple. Firstly, the government's own adviser, Mr Ross Garno has given evidence that this scheme is flawed and might actually be worse than doing nothing. When, in response to a question by Senator Macdonald asking if the scheme were not modified, will it still be better than nothing, Professor Garno said, that is really a hard question. Let me say it would be finally balanced. It was further reported that Professor Garno said it might be better to drop the proposed model and have another crack at it and do a better one when the time is right. Secondly, the purpose of the wealth transfer scheme advocated by the leftists in charge of this is to change people's behaviour. This scheme actually compensates a group of people in excess of what the cost of the introduction of the ETS would incur. Now, this might seem like a generous gesture by the government, but to me it is further evidence that the scheme will not achieve what it intended to do. Instead, this bill sets in place a bureaucracy that will have an insatiable appetite for cash for, from industry and transferring to government. The question for the advocates of this scheme is why anyone would act in the national interest 
actually be endorsing such a ridiculous proposal. Of course, they'll say it's to act on climate change, but it won't make any difference. And because it won't make any difference, you've got to say, what the heck are they doing it for? Ah, of course, I'm now reminded that uh, Mr Rudd claimed this is the greatest moral issue of our time, where the cost of inaction is greater than the cost of action. Why then has the government delayed the commencement of the scheme? Has reality smacked the disingenuous Rudd government in both of its faces? If so, here's a little more reality for you to contemplate from your gilded cage. Yes. This, bill, this bill will damage our economy. It will lift taxes, it will kill jobs, and it won't make a jot of difference to the climate. Under the Rudd Wong scheme, Australian industry will be taxed an extra $12 billion over five years. Many of these industries won't be able to pass on these costs. Some will simply close down or move overseas. The already struggling and, in most case, cases, poorly managed state governments will also suffer with one estimate they will be $1.4 billion poorer as a result of this scheme. Even the most uninformed would have to realise that this would result in higher state taxes and charges or a decline in services or possibly both. And this scheme will also affect wages. Treasury Secretary Dr Henry has stated, it is my understanding that in general terms the real wages in alternative employment would probably be lower than the real wages offered in the mining sector. In other words, in other words this scheme will force some people out of their current jobs into lower paid jobs, hardly the outcome designed to boost prosperity in an already damaged economy. According to the minerals industry, this scheme will impose costs of $2 billion per annum and seriously damage their competitive position. The grains industry, a very low emitter, will be slugged with an annual indirect cost of more than $500 million Order. per Order. year, hardly the stuff to support their international competitiveness. Order. Already un it's un being 2pm, we will proceed to questions without notice.